here are some thoughts about why you need to learn pathology if you want to become a doctor and how you might go about learning it. My name's Simon Cross, I'm Professor of Diagnostic Histopathology at the University of Sheffield and I'm editor of Underwood's Pathology. Now, the main thing you might want to think about is why bother to learn pathology in the first place? After all, it's only a tiny percentage of medical graduates who go on to become pathologists. Now, part of the problem might be the perception of pathology. With Silent Witness and all those other programmes on the television, people tend to think of forensic pathology when you say pathology. They tend to think of it as doing autopsies on people who've been murdered. Now, actually, that isn't what pathology is about at all. It's not what histopathology is about, the medical specialty that I work in. That's looking at biopsies for diagnosis of disease in living patients, you know, endoscopic biopsies taken from the stomach, colon, little lymph node biopsies, things like that. And actually what pathology is at its you know, best definition is the study of disease. And as soon as you realise that, you realise that pathology is pretty central to medicine. Because if we didn't know anything about disease, we wouldn't know how to diagnose it or treat it. And whatever medical specialty you go into, general practice, paediatrics, surgery, any, any specialty at all, you need to know about the diseases that you're treating. It even happens now in psychiatry because we have a much better idea of the genetic and biochemical basis of psychiatric diseases such as bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. So you can't really escape the fact that you're going to be dealing with disease as a doctor and it's best to know about it. And here are a couple of examples, very simple ones, as to why you need to know about it. So say you're a surgeon, perhaps a plastic surgeon, and you've been sent a patient who has a skin lesion on their forehead which has been diagnosed as a basal cell carcinoma. What do you want to do about that? Well, you need to know about basal cell carcinomas of the skin. And there are three important facts. Firstly, they're malignant tumours, so you probably want to treat it, don't you? You don't want to leave a patient with a malignant tumour that's untreated. Secondly, they're locally invasive. So if you do leave basal cell carcinomas, they will invade into local tissues. So you do want to remove them. But the third important fact is that they very rarely spread to other parts of the body. That is, they very rarely metastasize. So using that knowledge of pathology, you could come up with the idea that if you manage to completely locally remove that basal cell carcinoma from the patient's forehead, they would be cured of that tumour. So that's very useful. You need to know that pathology. And then after that, then you need to know all your specialist surgical knowledge about how it could be excised, leaving the least you know, scarring on the patient's forehead, all that sort of thing. But you need to know about the pathology before you start. Another example would be a chest surgeon, say, who sees a patient with small cell carcinoma of the lung. So, first of all, they know it's a malignant tumour, so it needs treatment. And they look on the CT scan, and it's only a very small tumour in a main bronchus on one side. So that it's possible that you could, provided the other lung has satisfactory function, take out that lung and then you will have removed the tumour. But that would probably be the wrong thing to do because the other thing about pathology of small cell carcinoma of the lung is that it's notorious for spreading to other sites of the body even when it's quite small in the lung. So there may be really a tumour one or two centimetres big in the lung but it may have already spread by the blood and lymphatics to the liver, the brain, bone, all sorts of places. So you'd have to reassure yourself very, very carefully that it hadn't spread anywhere else before considering surgery. And in fact, in most cases, it has spread at the time of diagnosis. So surgery is inappropriate because you'd be 
subjecting the patient to a big operation with little benefit because the tumour elsewhere in the body would still be growing and would manifest itself soon after and perhaps chemotherapy would be the way forward. So just a very simple example of a couple of tumours and how you need to know the pathology in order to be able to decide the best treatment. So pathology really is the scientific base for most medical practice. Of course, there's a huge amount of other stuff you need to know, like how to speak to patients, how to listen to patients, how to examine them, and then what treatments you might do once you've diagnosed disease. But at the base of all of that is the knowledge of those diseases, which is pathology. So I hope you can see that it's beneficial to learn about pathology because it's the base on which you can put all your medical knowledge. It'll all hang together if you know pathology. Now, how should you go about doing it? You know, here's Underwood's textbook. I think it's a good textbook, but then I'm biased because I edit and write some of it. But it's quite a big, thick textbook. It's about 600 pages. So what do you do with that? Do you buy it? Look at its shiny new cover, open it up at the front and read it all the way through to the end. I don't think so, you know. That's not a good way to learn. What you need to do is learn in an active sort of way rather than just passively going through things. You know, eventually you might want to read the first few chapters through because they do set out fundamental things about pathology which is quite nice to know about. But, you know, with the best will in the world, a textbook's a textbook. Here's a page from it. We try to put lots of diagrams and pictures in to make learning easier from it, but sometimes you're still going to be faced with a page of text. And it's got a load of fancy medical words in it which you may not be familiar with straight away, so it can be tough going. Here's a much better way of doing it. The general principle is you've got to do something with information to turn it into your own personal knowledge. So in medicine, there's way too much information. Lectures, textbooks, stuff on the internet, all sorts of things. Ward rounds, patients, that's a good bit, but you know, lots of information. And you have to process it in some sort of way to turn it into useful knowledge, which you can then use in your medical career. And remember, you're going to be practicing medicine for 40 years. So a few months investment in learning things that are going to be useful for 40 years is well worth it. And pathology is one of those things. So what you need to do is set up your learning situation so you're doing active learning and turning information into knowledge. So my way of doing it would be to base it on cases or problems that you come across. Maybe problems if you have problem-based learning earlier in your course, patients when you get out in the wards and see real people with real diseases. So here's a real person. It's not it's actually imaginary, but the sort of thing that you could see. Mr. Smith, you're working in A&E on acute medicine take. He comes in, he's 58 years old. He says he's got terrible pain in the center of his chest. You can see that he's very overweight. He tells you he's a lifelong cigarette smoker. And even on cursory physical examination, you can see that he's pale and sweaty. Now, you don't really have to go to medical school to hazard a guess at what's wrong with him. You're thinking about a heart attack, aren't you? Or if you've been to medical school for a bit longer, a myocardial infarction, because you've acquired the fancy words for heart attack. And what you need to do is, you know, you look at Mr. Smith with the doctors who are admitting him. They may let you examine him. You can speak to him. So Mr. Smith's, you know, firmly lodged in your mind. He's a real person with a real disease. And what you do is the next time you've got a few minutes, preferably the same day, you pick up your textbook. Underwood's pathology would be a good one to pick up. And you look up ischemic heart disease and myocardial infarction. Here's the first page of it from the textbook. And actually, if you look up ischemic heart disease in Underwood's pathology, there's only four pages, so it's probably going to take you 15 minutes to read. So you read those four pages, 
and you relate them to Mr. Smith. You've got an image of Mr. Smith, you remember certain details about his social history, etc. And then you link that to what's in the pathology textbook. And, you know, it's amazing how much you can remember. You know, I can remember the names of patients that I saw in outpatients when I was a medical student 25 years ago. They're still lodged in my brain and what diseases they had. And I'm sure they will be with yours. So what you need to do is use that very valuable key to learn pathology, medicine, the whole of it. And then if you see Mrs. Brown a couple of weeks' time coming into casualty, she's got chest pain, but it's not quite so central. Perhaps it goes down her arm a bit. She's thin. She hasn't smoked. You know, has she got a a myocardial infarction or not? You do tests, find out whether it is. And then you go back at the next earliest opportunity and look up ischemic heart disease again. Now, this time it's only going to take you 10 minutes to read because you've read it before. And again, you see how it fits in with Mrs. Brown's case. And if you do that all through your medical student career, it's really not difficult to learn medicine. You know, the main problem of medicine is volume. It's not mathematics and physics. You don't have to understand really complicated theorems that require a lot of abstract thought. You just need to get information and turn it into your own personal knowledge. And that's a great way of doing it. We've tried to make it easy for you with the textbook. There are these body diagrams at the beginning of each organ-based chapter, heart, lungs, gut, liver, etc. This one's for lymph nodes, which show you the clinical problems that can present due to pathology in that system. So, you know, someone with itching, pruritus, the fancy name for it, of the skin, might have Hodgkin's lymphoma. They probably won't, but it's something to consider. Someone with a prolonged fever may have glandular fever, infectious mononucleosis. So these diagrams give you an idea of what can be causing patients' signs and symptoms. And there's two indexes in the book. At the back, there's an ordinary index, so you can look up Hodgkin's disease. But at the front, there's a problem-based index, because we know you see patients who have problems And you may be in a problem-based learning situation where you need to look up problems rather than diseases. So you can look up itching there and it will list all the different causes of itching, amongst which will be Hodgkin's lymphoma, but there'll be commoner things like eczema. Um, So you can look up things like that. It's an easy way into the knowledge. Another good way to reinforce your learning is to test your knowledge and There are a number of testing materials available to you on the web that come with the textbook. If you open the front cover, there's a little silver panel. You can scrape it off with a coin. You won't win the lottery. However, you will have a code which you can type in to access all the materials on Student Consult that come with the textbook. And amongst that, there's a lot of multiple choice question, a few hundred multiple choice questions. And you can, you know, test yourself on the cardiovascular system if that's what you've been looking at. There are also some case studies with pictures, x-rays, you know, always a good way of testing your knowledge. And you can look up a case that's similar to one you've seen, but with different nuances and test your knowledge that way. We've also, this edition, added in just some simple non-cryptic crosswords that enable you to make sure you've got the vocabulary sorted for that particular area. So active learning, really good way of doing it. Coming up to exams, you might need to sit down a bit more with a textbook and look through things. I'm pretty confident that if you just keep learning small amounts related to patients or problems you've seen, that you won't have to spend, you know, the whole of your life in the library revising for exams. You need to top up your knowledge a bit, but you should generally have a decent core knowledge that will stand you in good stead. If you do have to sort of look up things that are rare and you haven't seen cases of and do a bit more systematic revision for exams, you can make notes which kind of 
makes it a bit more active. I like these, you probably know about them already, so-called mind maps or spider diagrams. I like them because they're very visual and you can put little, little cartoons to make it easier to remember. But because you're having to organise the knowledge into different branches and twigs on the tree, that makes more of an active process. There's, if you can do it on pieces of paper, which is great, you can do it on software if you want. There's a lot of free software out there that will do that. If you type in mind maps into Google, it will send you to the sources of that free software. We did think about putting mind maps in the textbook this time, but the thing about them is if we'd have put them in, it would have made it passive learning for you. Whereas if you do them yourself, it's active learning. And it's interesting how many problems actually there are. You know, we have a database in Sheffield Medical School of problems students need to learn about. And there's only 100, 110 of them. It seems a lot, but one mind map per problem would sort you out. And it wouldn't be a huge amount of you know, work to do that consistently over a couple of years. So th those are my thoughts on learning medicine, really, in general but pathology specifically, why you should learn it, and how you can use Underwood's pathology in your learning process when you're at medical school. I hope that's useful to you.